a big part of invention, engineering, product development is managing complexity and moving complexity around. In fact, like if you think about high level, what we, what we can do, and if you understand the different systems and the different disciplines, you can effectively move complexity around where it's really hard in one area, but not so hard in another area. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. And our guest today is Stevie Batish. And Stevie leads the Applied Sciences Group here at Microsoft. And this is a multidisciplinary team that combines physics and optics and AI and machine learning. And it creates the devices and the UI experiences that we encounter in our day-to-day -day and at work and at home, which, you know, I guess for most of us is kind of the same place, right? <laughs> it, it, it certainly has been uh, over the past uh, year and change, although changing. Um, although, yeah. Yeah, although. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just super, super excited to be having this conversation with Stevie. He has, you know, has been and is one of my favorite colleagues and collaborators here at Microsoft. He's had this amazing, you know, 20 plus year career, um, really leveraging what I think is a monumentally broad curiosity. Like he's just interested in so many things and like pulling all of those different areas together to find new and innovative ways to harness the power of those disciplines together. Uh, I mean, it's just so interesting talking to him always uh, and to like actually see the work that he he's able to produce with it, with this unique approach to, to, to doing stuff. I love it. I love it. Great. So let's, uh, let's see what Stevie is up to these days. Joining me today is Stevie Batish. Stevie is a technical fellow at Microsoft. He leads our Applied Sciences Group, which is an interdisciplinary team of scientists and product engineers. His expertise lies in multidisciplinary approaches to inventing technologies and experiences for Windows and devices. He's been shipping and inventing new devices, interfaces, and experiences for 20 years, from the original Surface table to our present line of tablets and laptops. Welcome, Stevie. Thanks, Kevin. It's so cool you do this, man. I'm excited. I'm giddy. I, I appreciate the time you're going to spend uh, spend together. And uh, this is just so cool. I'm just, I yeah, love that I, you do this for the company. Yeah, I'm, I, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting for me, too. Like, I always uh, love opportunities to chat with you. So uh, being able to do this on tape so that everybody can hear it, I think is, uh, is neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no pressure that it's recorded, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd love to start with you as a kid and how you got interested in science and technology, because you, you have a really broad curiosity and set of interests, and, and you know, I'd love to understand how that started. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, as a kid, we we I was so I was born in Lebanon, uh, right in the middle of the Civil War, and that kind of set us off in moving every few years different countries. And so we moved around a lot as a kid. You know, I lived in Libya, Pakistan. I lived in Stockholm for five years, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. You know, Queens, New York, and then finally we landed in Texas, where I started going to. Um, you know, junior high school. And then we finally moved to Virginia, where I went to high school and eventually a college. But, you know, that moving around, like, it exposed me to a lot of different cultures, a lot of different environments, but it also gave me a fair bit of alone time, um, you know, which allowed me to kind of develop, you know, and kind of poke my curiosity and like go in my room and build a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, and I got really interested in like robotics. Um, I built a lot of robots when I was younger and that kind of set me off in college as well. 
And and who was supporting you in that interest when you were a kid? Were your parents uh, scientists or engineers? Or did you have those folks around you? Or you were just figuring this out on your own? My parents are not scientists or engineers, but they were just supportive in letting me do whatever I wanted. I was a good kid, you know, but, you know, I broke a lot of stuff and, you know, <laughs> I didn't really get yelled at too much for that. And I liked building things, taking things apart. You know, my dad helped me get my first computer. It was like the Atari, one of the really old ones, Atari 130. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was in Saudi Arabia at the time, so I didn't get exposed to like the typical computers that were exposed in the U.S. So I got like Atari and Acorn and, you know, that sort of thing. And my dad was just, they were just, everyone was just very supportive, both my parents. It wasn't until really high school where I started getting like my teachers being great mentors. And then in college when I had, you know, people that really changed my life, you know, forever. Where did you guys moved to in Virginia? Like, where did you go to high school? In Northern Virginia, Broad Run High School. I'm in Ashburn over here, about 40 minutes away from DC. Very rural sort of place. It's built up now. You know, this is where all the data centers are, by the way, you know, so yeah. you know, like you drive around, there's like data centers left and right all, all over. That wasn't like the case before. This is where AOL was here. That's where they started, you know, yep. kind of crazy stuff. And so... When you went to college, did you know you wanted to major in engineering? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think like in high school, I was really inspired by the robotics that were happening at MIT. Uh, I was a professor there named Rodney Brooks, and I would just read their papers and, you know, like trying to understand. I got interested in this, this technique that they had developed called subsumption architecture. And it was inspired by ants um, or like insects and how to basically develop a control system for a robot. And so, you know, I wanted to build something like that myself and I did that. And so I knew like computers and engineering was kind of my path. And Virginia Tech was a really good option here for me. Yeah. Virginia Tech is a great school. I, I'm also, I, I grew up in Virginia. I know, you're UVA, I heard you. <laughs> I, I have UVA, but, but like we don't need to have any of the UVA, Virginia Tech tension. No, uh, no, we're no. All good. That's, that's right. It's, that's not necessary. I mean, even though we're better at football, but that's totally fine. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, my, it's it's sort of funny. My, my two best friends uh, who, you know, have been my best friends since I was a little kid. Both of them went to Virginia Tech. Like one, uh, one, uh, got electrical engineering degree there, and the other got a chemistry degree there. And like awesome. I was, uh, I was computer science uh, elsewhere. Um, awesome. But it, yeah, tech's a great school. My mentor was Professor Amaretis in the chemistry department. So interesting. And I got my double E. So interesting sort of parallels there. Yeah, they they had a fantastic, and and probably still do have a fantastic chemistry department. Oh, uh, yeah. Just some really really interesting characters there. Oh yeah. So. Yeah, one of the things that is super interesting about you, and you already alluded to it, is you really have this curiosity in in these boundaries between disciplines. So, you know, this subsumption uh, robotic stuff that's, uh, you know, inspired by ants, uh, you know, that that you just mentioned is, I think, an example. And you've gone on to, like, build a bunch of, uh, like, robotic systems uh, while you were in, in college that were at this intersection. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So first I did three internships at Microsoft and in one of the kind of in-between rotations, I got really interested in trying to do biomimetics of ant behavior and colonies. I was really excited by the fact that, you know, while you might have a robot that had simple rules, a swarm of them would have kind of emergent behavior. And I wanted to kind of replicate that. But that led me to something else. And I got into an idea where instead of trying to build a control system for a robot, why not just steal it? And so I went to the entomology department at at Virginia Tech and I said, I had this idea where I want to use a control system from an insect to power my robot. And the guy, Dr. Blumkiss, Blumkiss was his name. He's like, oh, that's really crazy, but let's try it. And we took a cockroach uh, and we attached the cockroach to one of my robots. We uh, used uh, probes to kind of get signal from the insect itself. And we had the robot kind of like an as an exoskeleton. Oh, sorry, the cockroach had an exoskeleton of this robot and it would drive around. And I t- took that work into the Tom Daniel lab at UW, uh, and I did it with Moss uh, later on, but it was this idea of the synergy of essentially transducing biological signal 
putting him in some sort of environment, that environment, the biological system was, was essentially affect through end effectors that are artificial, like my robot, it would affect the environment, that environment would generate signal back into the senses of the insect and you kind of close the loop there. And the fascinating thing is like, you know, the system, the biological system adapted, it was plastic, it conformed to the parameters that I gave it and was able to eventually kind of control the car effectively and even obstacle avoid. And I was like, that's so cool. I mean, that was, that was kind of the experiment, you know, that showed me uh you know how powerful biology is and how bad i was at programming you know? <laughs> <laughs> well those, those are two things that are uh, that are good for all of us to learn uh, yeah. like i think every computer scientist or software engineer has that moment in their career where they just realize how much they have left to learn about oh, totally. getting better at their craft. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, you know, this is a funny story. Like I did a podcast with Tom Daniel and Tom was telling me this story about you. And like, I'd known you pretty well for three and a half years at that point. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize Stevie had done that sort of work before. Uh, it's cool. really I mean, I think that, you know, the the interesting thing is like you have taken that multidisciplinary approach and just continue to do it over and over again. I, I'd love to talk now a little bit about what you do here at Microsoft, which is extremely multidisciplinary. You're absolutely right. It's kind of my one of my core philosophies, and it's helped me have this opportunity to build this team, this applied sciences group uh, that you know, mixes the disciplines. You know, I, I try not to organize around function. Um, I organize around really people and really encourage folks to look at the problem holistically and try to solve the problem holistically and pull tools from the various disciplines to kind of solve problems. And the broader your approach is, you know, I think sometimes the more surprised you could come at at the solution, sometimes the more optimal the solution is. So I've been lucky. I have I think one of the best jobs, my, you know, the most cherished thing is to do something every day that you love so much that you kind of feel lucky that you're able to do. And, you know, and I think maybe the internships helped me set up, but the people around me really encouraged me. I've been in the same job for Microsoft for 21 years. I haven't really changed roles. It's just kind of just things have kind of just evolved. And this role, which is this boundary between doing research and product development is just the same thing I've been doing for 21 years. I've just kind of grown it and grown it organically into the various disciplines that we have today from, you know, physics, optics, you know, AI, machine learning, the software development, uh, you know, uh, sensing and display. So, you know, and we try to mix all these kind of technologies together to create optimal systems. Yeah. One of the things that I've always believed and, and it may be a convenient belief, not a, not a good one, it is that you can be so much more creative when you have lots of different tools that you have at your disposal. And you don't need to be a master even at all of the tools, but just knowing a little bit about a lot of things can let you discover stuff that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise or to approach problems in ways that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And it seems like that's something that you, uh, you may believe as well. 100%. A big part of invention, engineering, product development is managing complexity and moving complexity around. In fact, like if you think about high level, what we, what we can do, and if you understand the different systems and the different disciplines, you can effectively move complexity around where it's really hard in one area, but not so hard in another area. You know, yeah. and that's why I love this boundary that I kind of work in between hardware and software. Can I, I can move it back and forth, you know, yeah. and, you know, I could do something really hard in optics and I'm like, Phew, man, but then like shift it over to software. And have yeah. software essentially solve the problem instead of doing an optic or vice versa, right? Yeah, and I think it's everywhere. I mean, just uh, just an example, like I uh, I spent a, a couple hours yesterday making um, making a mount for a tablet. Uh, you know, just sort of a silly thing, but I wound up uh, solving the problem of like how to hold this uh, little touchscreen tablet uh, on a flexible arm uh, with. 3D printing and laser cutting and uh, CNC machining. And there were parts like mechanically of building this thing that were 
uh, easy in each of those tool sets that would have been very hard in the others. Um, and like just having those tools at your disposal and knowing how to use them, uh, like made a thing that would have taken like a few days uh, to build uh, into something that took like an hour, oh, uh, which is awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in having the right tool. It just changes the whole game. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that you've been doing with AI, which is uh, a relatively new but extremely powerful tool that we're increasingly used to do exactly what you're talking about, like this, uh, you know, taking something that's very, very complex to solve any other way and making it possible using this new tool. So, so t talk a little bit about what uh, what you have been doing with Edge AI. Yeah, let me digress a little bit. And so one of the core axioms that I have is that, um, and one of the things I'll, I, I, I've been doing almost my entire career is, like I said, you know, transducing, you know, biological signal, interpreting them, and then giving signal back. And, you know, I did that like with the Mothmobile, but at Microsoft, you know, the, the person is the one generating the biological signal, right? And, and using hardware and software to understand and to do some intent um, to gather their information, I think has been, you know, uh, so far, uh, you know, a, a lifelong, I've been, you know, career at it. And, and it's a lot of fun, I, you know, all, all the way from like simple things like mice to, you know, keyboards to like the surface table that we developed to, uh, you know, to these uh, magic window displays where we put cameras behind them to try to make people feel like they're in the same room uh, to now, you know, shifting that complexity to software and, and edge AI. You know, I'm a big believer in doing computation in the right place. And one of the right places right now that I'm really excited about is doing computation in our computers, in our devices, right there at the source, right in front of a person and using computational capacity to do extraordinary things. And I think that's kind of the revolution that's right in front of us. Um, that is so exciting, especially in the PC world. Yeah, so yeah, there was this really interesting uh, Scientific American article that got published, I think in 1995, where the term ubiquitous computing uh, right. or ambient computing, I forget which one, uh, you know, he used, uh, like were coined. And I think, you know, this notion of, trying to figure out how to use technology to serve human needs uh, where you adapt the technology to the human needs versus forcing humans to adapt themselves to the technology is like a really interesting way to think about problem solving. And I, I think, you know, that's maybe another way of, of talking about what you just said. Uh, so like a lot of the things that you're doing, uh, you know, the, the, you, you're shifting the complexity into the technology to benefit the benefit the human rather than like you know forcing the human to like uh, bear the burden of the complexity. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And if you if you want to be even more abstract about it, it is a form of robotics or automation. It is you know trying to take high level commands and essentially deconstruct them and have them do work for you. Yeah. It's such a fascinating thing like this. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important for us to, it's Im really important for us to focus on like this, this idea that the human is always at the center of what it is that we're doing. And like our purpose is to build tools for humans to help them do more of what they want to do. Um, and, and it's one of the things that makes me really excited about the work that you do because like you're just sort of constantly exploring that uh, that landscape of opportunities and like I've seen so many demos that you've uh, created since I've been here over the past four years where you know you're just constantly looking for those opportunities. Um, how do you decide what to poke at next? Hmm. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the past 20 years is that ideas come from everywhere. And one of the important things that I have to do is leave room for serendipity, leave room for the creative process. I've learned so many times that 
if you are overly prescriptive in the beginning, you're probably going to stifle invention and you're going to stifle ingenuity. But at the same time, if you let it go hog wild, you won't get things that are essentially guided or directed or useful to the business. And so that's kind of the beauty about the culture that we have in our group, you know, the applied science group being so close to windows and devices, understanding and getting signal about the problems that we're having. And we have, you know, I would say a fair degree of ability to try to solve problems that are directly focused for the business. And I would say we try to do that by essentially creating a portfolio of projects that are from near term to slightly further term and ensure that what we do actually has impact today, but potentially can give us room to change the direction of the future. Which is, I think, a beautiful way of looking at things, like especially this idea that you, all, you really do need to leave room for serendipity because some of the interactions between creative people and the interactions between complex technologies and the interaction between the now and the future are so complex that if you believe that you understand everything and that, uh, right. you know, you, you're in control, uh, like you're probably wrong. A hundred percent, you know, and, and the way we've managed that in the past, you know, it's funny, like people would make fun of me, like early in my career, I would, I would do so many like projects and, uh, some of them were good and made it in the products. Uh, some of them were kind of crazy and didn't necessarily make them the products. But I knew that there was a thread there. And I would put them in a box, put a label on them, and put them on a shelf. And so I was known for like this, you know, this, you know, archive of plastic boxes and bins of little tiny research projects. And, you know, when ideas would kind of reshuffle themselves, I would go up and look at my bin to see what I've done in the past, pull the bin out, you know, and then like see what I did. Because these were all like functional demos and prototypes, you know, that are really helpful to kind of elucidating if this is actually idea is possible or not. That is such a good idea. <laughs> like really, really a good idea. I, I, I wish, uh, you know, now that you said it, like I'm sort of regretting not, uh, not more faithfully archiving all of the failed things that I've done. Oh, yeah. and, and, and there have been more failed things. <laughs> Things oh. and they've been successful things. <laughs> and well, actually, I don't even use the word failure as much because I always I use this terminology with my team is like, you know, failure is only the if you measure it at that moment in time. They're just waypoints towards successes because they just guide you along your path. And you know, we all know this, right? But yeah, no, I think the, the it, it makes it difficult to move when you have all those bins, though. So I was yeah. I was I was lucky. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Steve, we need to move your office. I'm sorry. Look at the look at my. You can't. And they're like, all right, we'll just leave you there. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like most of my output over the course of my career have been software things, uh, where yeah, you know, it's hard to think about like how to even put it into a bin uh, to keep. And like, it's a shame because I do think that the software that you've written that hasn't worked in the moment, like we just treat it as ephemeral and it like evaporates and goes away. And like, there are just lessons in there right now. I, I will occasionally think to myself, wow, I, I, I wish I had that code that I wrote back in grad school, or I wish I, you know, like what, what was it that I learned from like this thing that didn't quite work? And, yeah. and like, we just like the tools have changed so dramatically that I've just lost a huge amounts of this code that I've, uh, that I've written where I just can't see it anymore. I so I, I, I love it that you uh, that you do this. Like I think it's incredibly uh, incredibly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I would love to get your perspective on is what do you think the most interesting technological shifts have been over the past few years, and like what are you excited about over the over the next few? You know, the one that has really guided guided a lot of the work um, that I have done is, you know, this disruptive evolution of new computing form factors. And, you know, the thing that that I've seen that changes uh, or that gives us or grants us the ability of creating these new types of forms that allow us to put these forms into different environments, into different use cases, into different places on the body, into different places in the environment is the creation of interactive technologies. You know, basically, how do I digitize information and how do I communicate that information back to you? So display technology, you know, has been 
just an amazing kind of transformation since the old CRT days. And that has really enabled us to build all sorts of computers. The sensing technology where, you know, in the old days I was using, we were using computer vision to sense what you were doing on top of a screen. And now it's all shifted to capacitive technology um, and pen and trying to sense essentially there, but we treat it like an imager. And now we're at the place where we start infusing signal from all these different sensors of the camera, of the context of the environment, of, of the information that you've generated in the world using AI to try to deduce and understand intent. And I think we just scratched that idea. We've just scratched that surface. That's going to change the game for us. And this whole AI field is, you know, something that to me is going to blow our minds. In, yeah. in we're just beginning, Kev. Right? It's just like you know. I mean, to the point where it's it's going to change how we deploy, how we how software is created. It's going to change how software actually ends up being. Like right now, like I, you know, thinking about this actually this morning. Um, you know, like Word, when we write Word, Word is like this static fixed thing. Like we send, we give to the customer and then we update it once in a while. But what if Word actually adapted to the customer in the environment because it actually understood what you wanted and it wrote code itself that was custom to you, yeah. right? And we didn't really deploy like specific versions of Word. We, we deployed things that essentially would help people do word processing. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of the interesting things about machine learning. Like, I I think the thing it, it, pe people get like really caught up in this sensationalism uh, around the idea of like AGI or you know like the vision yeah. of AI from uh, you know from 1955 when the f founders of the field coined the term and like the, you know these science fictional AIs that are in in movies but like i've like as a machine learning practitioner for the past almost 20 years uh it's hard to uh, imagine ai in those terms because to me it's always felt like a tool and it's like a tool to like do this thing that you you've been talking about in, in our conversation today it's like managing complexity you use it to solve problems that are just too hard to solve any other way okay. um and I think the you know the the big paradigm shift for me has been that for you know 175 years or so, programming a computer or like leveraging a machine to go do a digital machine to go do work for you has been programming, uh, and programming requires a specialist understanding of the capabilities of the machine, and then like a whole bag of tricks that you know you learn over the course of a long number of years to uh, yeah, instruct the machine how to solve a problem uh, and like translating these human understandings of problems into a form that the machine can go do something with, which is very different from what you do with machine learning, where you are teaching a machine how to solve problem with data and examples. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very profound shift in the way that you harness the power of a computer, and I, I think exactly what you said is the is the real possibility. It's the opening up the power of a machine to a huge number of people, maybe everyone, to in very sophisticated ways help them solve their problems. I can't agree with you more. That is it. That is that is the gold. That is absolute. It's democratizing. You know things that took like you know eight years in college to go figure out, and yep. now you can hand it to millions of people in the world. And imagine what the world could do. Yeah. You know, with that ability. I mean, you're just continuing to evolve society and culture to develop more sophisticated tools that get become more and more ingrained in our culture and the way of living and how we actually go do things. And it's going to affect every industry, everything yeah. that we do. Right. It's going to it's going to change the world. And, and that's the thing. Like, I wish I could, like, pause time and go 50 years forward because I want to go see that or 100 years forward because yeah. it's going to be so different than it is today. And the other point is, you know, to your earlier point about AGI, I mean, like, you know, these are just things where I think society ends up getting a little anxiety over in the beginning, like any technology. I mean, you know, like when ph photography was just first incepted, people thought like when you took a picture of someone, you stole their spirit. 
you know, like, and, and now today, like we capture pictures all the time. You're not, you're not really steering, you're not really capturing my spirit, you know, yeah. or stealing it. Like, you know, so I think it just takes a little time because uh, it's about understanding and what it can do and really what it can't do. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's also about like figuring out what the norms are and like, you know, what the acceptable use, I mean, like with cameras, for instance, like there's paparazzi yeah. and like all sorts of obnoxious uses yeah. of technology. And we've sort of learned, you know, where, you know, where it's appropriate to take a picture and where it's inappropriate, like where it's legal and where it's illegal. And uh, like, you know, we'll have to develop all of that stuff as well with, uh, with any new technology that we build. Um, the, the, you know, the thing that we have to do, I think, is we have to help everyone understand what the tools are capable of so that, uh, like, as many people as possible have a voice in deciding how the tool should be used, uh, yeah. you know, as, as quickly as possible. Because, like, that's the true way to make sure that we get these norms mapped out in a reasonable way, uh, you know, quickly. I think that's one of the really things I admire about Microsoft in general is that I feel like we believe we have such a responsibility to make sure that evolves well for our governments, for our society, for, for people. And we are so responsible in that category and, and very proactive, you know, in regards to that. And I think that's, that's cool because that level of proactivity allows us to go invent this technology. Yeah. You know, the thing is, it doesn't mean that we get it right 100% of the time, but it like, no. it does mean that like we feel a very serious commitment to goal seek to write, uh, you know, as quickly as we can. Yeah. 100%. So, you know, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to ask this question in two ways. Um, so it, it's about advice for people who are starting their careers. And so I, I'd love to know if there's anything that uh, Stevie today would uh, you know, give advice to Stevie from 21 years ago. Um, you know, like if you could go back in time and like whisper in your younger ear, or like, what would you, uh, what would you tell yourself? That's such a great question. And I appreciate that. Actually, I get right now. It's funny. I don't know why I've been getting a lot of requests to, to mentor or give advice to kids, especially transitioning to college. And the thing that I was taught that I've held dear and near to my heart and used as kind of a guiding principle is this thing we talked about in the beginning, this, this thinking of a multi interdisciplinary nature where what you want to do is create a unique combination of skills that sets yourselves apart from everyone else that makes you unique drawing from crazy different fields. And so studying different subjects, uh, fusing di disciplines together. I mean, these things are silos. Nature didn't put those silos around though. People did put those silos around there. Nature, nature doesn't see those silos. They use all of it, right? And nature is our best engineer, our best inventor, and therefore, you know, use it. Another one is um, Gary Starkweather taught me this. He was one of my early mentors at Microsoft. Gary Starkweather is a dear person. He was the inventor of the laser printer, had an amazing career. And he taught me that if your idea isn't absurd enough, it's probably not good enough. And to really kind of stretch and do it. And he actually told me, he said, don't worry about people stealing your ideas because if it's really a good idea, you have to shove it down their throats. You know, <laughs> it's like, it was like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, Gary. Um, but he had like all these whimsical sayings uh, that he's built up over, over time. And he was, I would say that that sort of thinking is quite helpful. It just shows that you have to, uh, it goes kind of that the whole serendipity of thinking where you don't know what you don't know and you want to kind of get out of the fray, you know. And if I were to go back in time and kind of whisper a little bit in my ear, you know, I really liked the journey I went through. I loved it. I like, you know, doing three internships at Microsoft really exposed me to a whole bunch of things. Turning down a full-time offer from Microsoft between my undergrad and grad was really important because I needed that grad school exposure. That grad school exposure, again, advice for everyone, it teaches you how to acquire new fields. Because, you know, I was a double E bioengineering guy, but now I'm like a display expert, optics person, AI is now a new field you know, that I've kind of migrated towards and developed, but life evolves. And if you have the tools to evolve with it, I think you, you've set yourself up for a happy, yeah. kind of happy and evolving life. Yeah. I, I look, I couldn't agree 
more with this notion of getting yourself into a position where you've got a huge breadth of skills and like maybe yeah maybe the most important thing that anyone can do this is what i tell my kids all the time is like you have to figure out how to learn uh how to learn to love learning that's it and that's right you know if, if you are always curious and always wanting to like understand how things work and to and it's like absolutely necessary in our field because the technology itself is changing so fast. Like uh, most of what we use in our day to day job right now didn't exist uh, when we started our careers when we were getting That's educated. Right. Totally, yeah, I know. Um, yeah, we, we had to learn this as we moved, right? Yeah, and you know, part of it is we're inventing it, and part of it is like we're adapting to what's going on around us. But you know, it's it's sort of sort of an interesting thing. Like we, um. Yeah, you know, part of our job is like we're way out on the frontier of what's possible. Um, and the you know, the interesting thing about that is like every day, like you're you're sort of taking the step across that border from possible to impossible. Like everything's impossible before you figure it out. Uh and it just requires like intense commitment to like learning new things and curiosity and determination and uh you know like all, all things that i think you uh you're sort of exhibiting uh that's right every day and like that your group exhibits which is just it's tremendous yeah i mean i mean i don't have to i mean just mention my team like my you know like uh the the team members that i have are phenomenal and they're the ones that i learn from and you know they're they're educators. It's funny, like they're important, but they're 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 educators to me. And in their respective fields, they I think they're one of the best people anywhere around. And you know, every one on one is not it's not like it's for them. It's for me. I, I just learn from them and absorb the information. I'm lucky because of the people that I get to work with every day. I get to learn from those people. I get inspired by those people and I get to help essentially create and make decisions as a result of those learnings to kind of move forward. And I'm not bashful about saying that, like, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. You know. but uh, I totally agree with what you're saying. I have a couple of quotes I love to share with you. And I use this sometimes at kind of my end of my talks, but it, it kind of shows, you know, human evolution and human culture. There's a quote from this Roman engineer from 10 AD and he goes, uh, inventions have long since reached their limit, and I see no hope for further development. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and you can imagine, like, you know, that's that's like a thing sometimes people think, right? And in fact, I can tell you, like, that's that's even I have talked to people like even 10 years ago where where people said that, like, I think we're kind of done. I'm like, no, we're just yeah. kidding. it's not gonna stop. And then like this, there's this Lord Kelvin said this, and he goes, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Yeah. And that's a scientist, right? And what, yeah. a, what first very logical statement, you know, and th that, you know, just kind of goes shows like when you're trying to do something absurd, you know, you get run into these sort of stop signs uh, that people hold up, but it took a philosopher essentially to, to kind of twist it around. So Paolo Chiolo said, you know, be creative. Men only learned how to fly when they stopped imitating birds. Yeah. I think that's a great quote. My, my, my favorite state of mind is I don't know. Like it really <laughs> is because like that's, that's yeah. where interesting things start with. And so like, I think the smarter someone is and the more conviction they have uh, like around like a pedantic point of view, the more skeptical I am. <laughs> You're so right, Kevin, hundred percent, man. That's such a great way. Well, this was, Really, really awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with us. Uh, I'm sure folks are going to love hearing from you. It was fun. Awesome. So that was Kevin's conversation with Stevie Batiche. What I found remarkable was, and you you touched on this uh, when we were talking earlier, Kevin, is just the, the multidisciplinary aspect of everything that he does and, and the fact that he's kind of using those different disciplines to really make things better. But what struck me by that, I think, first and foremost, was, you know, he's lived so many different places, like as a, as a young kid, you know, he grew up all over the world. And I have to think that that really had an impact on his worldview and plays a role in this multidisciplinary approach that he's taken to his work. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really amazing, um, you know, just talking to CV and watching the work that he's done, how much he gets out of this broad curiosity by not being one dimensional, by understanding that the world is really, really broad. I, and I think it's absolutely, uh, you know, his experience growing up has influenced that. Um, but, you know, just coupling that broad curiosity with the desire to make and build, um, I, I think you see in a lot of folks like from, you know, Bill Gates and, you know, some of the founders of our modern technological computing revolution, like that, those two things, like that broad curiosity and the impulse to like go do something with the curiosity to make a thing, uh, is, is like a really powerful combo. Uh, and you really see it in, in Stevie's work. You no, know, you really can. And what I like about it is, is you're right. We have founders and we have examples, you know, like Bill Gates and others who have this, you know, broad curiosity and this broad kind of sense of interest. But a lot of times as workers and, and as, you know, uh, scientists or engineers or, or whatever the case may be, you're kind of encouraged uh, starting in school to focus on one thing. And to, to really do that and, and, and like they, they kind of hone into you, yeah, you know, to be successful, if you want to grow your career, if you want to grow your, your profession, whatever it is, you need to do this one thing. And what I think is great about Stevie is that he's really, he's done all these different things and he's got this curiosity and he's able to show, no, you can weave these things together and you can be successful. And if anything, having these additional perspectives can sometimes unlock stuff that you might not be able to um, unlock otherwise. Yeah, it's it's really it's a great observation. Um, you know, I, I used to a, until relatively late in my career feel guilty that uh, I was broadly interested in things rather than just interested in a single thing that I could focus on and like polish and craft and perfect and and just be you know, the absolute best at that one thing. But I was never wired like that. And my my parents, when I was a little kid, even gave me permission. Like I would get interested in, you know, a whole bunch of musical instruments. Like I played the flute and the clarinet and the piano. And mm -hmm. like I never mastered any of those instruments. Uh, and, you know, I would play around with the thing and, and so learn – yeah, what what was stimulating to learn, uh, and then I would move to the next thing, um, and I felt bad about that for many many years. Uh, and you know, I'm just sort of realizing with these conversations that we have with folks like Stevie, and like we've had many other folks like that on the podcast, that um, mastery is important, and you have to invest a lot of energy in getting good at a thing. But it's okay to do that across a bunch of different things. And sometimes magic happens when you can connect the dots between a whole bunch of different things that you've gotten reasonably good at. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. I read an essay recently about um, T-shaped engineers, and it really resonated with me because even though I'm not someone who's as accomplished as many things as CV is one of those things that kind of when you see people who've done well in that, it's like, yeah, you know what, it's okay to do this. And being able to draw the conclusions between different areas can be just as important as being a bona fide expert in one area. And and then when um, I, I was thinking about Stevie, when, uh, or rather I was thinking about that essay when I was listening to you and Stevie talk, because he to me is like that quintessential T-shaped engineer. And I think that that's really remarkable yeah look and i think even with you like you you're you have such an interesting background like you've been a journalist you've uh you've been an advocate you're a coder you're a, a technology enthusiast like you have all of these facets of who you are and like when those come together like that makes something unique and interesting um like i i love that in people Definitely. And I appreciate that. That makes me makes me feel good. And but but I think that seeing stuff that the Stevie's talking about and the amazing work that's being done, it just I don't know, I guess it to me reiterates whether it's a singular person or just getting different perspectives, having those perspectives is really yep. the key to unlocking the best technologies that we can. I could not agree with that more. 
All right. Well, that is a wrap. Thank you again to Stevie for joining us today. And remember that you can message us anytime at behindthetech at Microsoft.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.